Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, and today it is time for another question and answer video, so strap yourselves in, we have a long video ahead of us. And yes, I am horrifically mixing British and American. Now, these questions have all come in from very cool folks who help support Forgotten Weapons on Patreon. If you'd like to get your own question into the mix for next month, check out uh, my account on Patreon.com. There's a link in the description below. Sign up there. Buck a month goes a really long way towards helping me continue to do this, and it can get your question into the list. Now, as usual, there were way more questions than I could actually take, so I've got about two pages of them here, and we'll see how many we can get through. First off, from Merriham, says about the Smith & Wesson triple lock. What was that third lock? Explain how it worked and why s and dropped it from later model revolvers. Well, I don't actually have one here to demonstrate, unfortunately, but the triple lock is named for the three separate locking mechanisms that hold the cylinder in the frame. Now, these aren't the pieces that actually keep the cylinder lined up with the barrel. Um, and prevent it from rotating, you know, out slightly out of alignment while you're firing. That's the cylinder bolt that's separate. However, on Smith & Wesson revolvers, the cylinder rotates counterclockwise from the shooter's perspective, and the cylinder also opens to the left from the shooter's perspective. And what this means is every time you cock the gun, the hand that is rotating the cylinder is actually kind of trying to push the cylinder um, open and out of the frame. So Colt had well, you have a basic cylinder latch uh, to keep the cylinder locked into the gun, but Colt decided to make that a little bit better. Now, this was never a, a requirement on, say, a, a Colt revolver, because Colt cylinders rotate the other direction, and so they tend to be pushed into the frame by the, the hand and not out of it. Now, the, the three separate locks, Smith & Wesson introduced this in their new Century model in 1909, and in total, they made just over 15,000 of them before abandoning it in 1915. Now, part of the abandonment was production requirements from the war, and there were some other reasons that we'll get to in a moment. But the three separate locks that they had were one on the back face of the cylinder, which is the one you expect. And then, and then of course, when you push in the cylinder latch, that disengages. And then there was a spring-loaded stud on the end of the ejector rod, which helps keep the end of that uh, whole cylinder pin uh, aligned and in place, but for the new century model, partly because they wanted to show, you know, showcase their machining abilities, and partly because it was a larger revolver than they'd ever done before. It was uh, chambered in 44 Special, which was the hot, big, new Magnum cartridge at the time. They added a third one, which was a latch on the cylinder yoke. So below the cylinder, uh, below the ejector rod, when you pull the cylinder out, uh, where the, the yoke hit the front of the frame, there was a lock there, and that was the third, which made it the triple lock. Uh, it turns out you really didn't need that. Um, it was really totally superfluous. So they got rid of it when they introduced the second pattern of that gun in 1915 or 1917. Um, just didn't need it. Now a lot of people, um, including some very notable people like Elmer Keith, say that the triple lock was the best revolver Smith & Wesson ever made. And that may well be true, but the extra manufacturing cost simply wasn't worth it to them. So that's why they got rid of it. Uh, like I said, in total about 15, little over 15,000 of the guns were made primarily in 44 Special, although they did make some, a small number, in 45 Colt. They also made some in 455 Webley for the British, um, and I think there was another caliber as well. At any rate, um, after that they dropped the triple lock name because they kind of went down to a double lock which was still perfectly fine. Next question is from Jacob Z. Uh, we know about the universal disassembly tool. He means a ballpoint pen. Uh, but what do you do, uh, da, 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 but doing what you do, including range trips, two gun, etc. Uh, what are the tools you consider essential to have within reach, let's say at an auction house, disassembling a, or restoring a new gun or at matches? Well, um, as folks who know me will uh, maybe annoyingly say, I kind of sometimes am a little short on gear. That said, uh, I have put together a pretty good kit that I take to auction houses and when I'm going to travel somewhere where I'm going to be disassembling guns, and that is primarily two pieces of equipment. I have, they're both by Wheeler, I basically just looked on online uh, to find a decent set of punches, which I have here, 
hammer and punch set, and a set of screwdrivers, also Wheeler, right there. And a few other, actually the one other thing that I always take with me is a bore gauge or a muzzle gauge, because from time to time, I end up with a gun that I really don't know what the bore size is. And this is a handy little tool just to check that. Um, neither of these sets were particularly expensive. They're not top of the line. They're also not bottom of, bottom of the line, but the combination of hex head wrenches, Phillips head, uh, a wide variety of flathead uh, screwdrivers and punches has pretty much allows me to take care of anything that I need to do. So um, that's what I would recommend as a basic tool set, punches and screwdrivers. If you're interested in these two specifically, uh, check the description below. I'll have links to where you can get those on Amazon, but there are certainly tons of other options out there and there's nothing particularly special about these two. Uh, if I were out at the range, I often, uh, the things that I would consider essential would be a cleaning rod, uh, not for cleaning at the range, but to potentially knock out a stuck case. Um, that's something that happens from time to time. Um, oil, just in case you need to get something more lubricated than it is when you take it to the range. Um, your screwdriver and punch set, if you want to be really thorough and, um, water. Down here in the desert, I always, water is one of the most important things I could take to the range or a match or pretty much anything else I'm doing with firearms. Let's see. Uh, oh, ammo, magazines, they're important. Don't forget them. I've done that once in a while and it sucks. Next up from John N is the Hack 7 Halloway Arms Corporation. A good enough platform that if the rifle was redesigned to use modern magazines and was available in 223 and 308, would it be profitable? And I think this kind of leads to a deeper question of what makes guns profitable um, or successful. And there's more to it, there's a lot more to it than just, is it a high quality design? Um, I think what's often, what often happens is someone will come up with an idea and they'll, they'll get a prototype, proof of concept, okay, and then they get an early production model. And the early production model pretty much always has problems. Um, the Hack 7 is like that. Uh, for example, they have a little cover on the side uh, where they machined out the locking lug. And it just to simplify production, they put a little sheet cover on it, riveted it in place. Those things fall off because the rivets wear out um, under stress and break. That's a problem. That's something that would need to be revised. And that's what happens with these guns is you get an initial version that has some flaws and then the more it gets used, the more it gets improved. And eventually, you get to the point where you've got a really well-developed gun. The AK is really well-developed, the AR is really well-developed. Typically the stuff that gets a lot of military service turns out that way because the military keeps tinkering on it and finding problems and solving them. And by the end of that process, not only do you have the gun perfected, but you also have all of the, the initial tooling and R&D costs well and truly paid for. And the unit cost of producing a new gun drops to being pretty low. Uh, if you had a gun like the Hack 7, the problem is you have to put in enough money to develop it to the point that it's re as reliable as some of these guns that are on the market that are um, really well tested and perfected, and that takes a lot of money to do. And then you also, you need to have the price somewhere competitive because, for example, the Hack 7 is does use reasonably modern magazines. I mean, the magazines aren't that big of a deal for it. Um, and it's in 308, and yet people don't buy them today, in part because there weren't many made, but they're expensive. You know, they're several thousand dollars a piece. Well, if you put in even more money to make the, the Hack 7 better, you're going to push the price up, and it's only with production volume that you could hope to bring it down. So while it's, I think, it, the initial thought is, what most people expect is that a gun will survive or perish on its merits as a firearm. That's often not the case. That's only half the story, if even half the story. The rest of it is economics. Is it a gun that people actually want? Is it a gun that people will pay money for? And how much will they pay? And will they pay more for it than it costs you to make it? And if the answer is no, it doesn't really matter how good of a gun it was, you're not going to sell a whole lot. This is why, for example, the Thompson submachine gun, there were not very many Thompson guns sold. The, Thompson was in serious trouble if it hadn't been for World War II creating a huge new market for him. And the reason was the Thompson gun was like 200 bucks or more 
in the 1930s, 20s and 30s, when it was commercially available. Yeah, this was, it, for a large part of this, it was before the National Firearms Act. There was no legal restriction. You could, as they say, walk into your local hardware store and buy a Thompson submachine gun. But it's really expensive to do it. And not a lot of people did. They didn't have a whole lot of need for a Thompson submachine gun. Uh, same thing would apply to many of the heavy machine guns out there. For example, um, Colt sold uh, Model 1895 so-called potato digger, uh, gas-operated machine guns, and they sold them on the commercial market. If you wanted one, you could buy one. And in fact, for example, Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders had two of them, both of which were privately bought and used by volunteers. They weren't army issue guns, but those things are super expensive. And the only reason the Rough Riders had them was because they had a guy in the unit who was a son of the wealthy New York Tiffany family who could afford to go buy them a couple of brand new heavy machine guns. So would the Hack 7 be successful if it were in 223 using AR mags? I kind of doubt it because I think what you'd end up with is a gun that was not quite as good as an AR-15 because it didn't have, geez, what are we at, 60, 65 years of refinement in it and it would inevitably cost more than an AR-15. You can get a great AR for a thousand bucks and I doubt you could make a new improved Hack 7 for that. This is the conundrum of new gun development. There's not much out there that makes new guns better than what we have already, and so you're left with only a small number of ways to convince people to buy your new gun. Uh, next up, from Autumn, how do you preserve and maintain the condition of firearms in your reference collection? Are there any particular methods or types of products you use? Uh, not really. Um, this is something where I think I do a lot less than most people might expect. Now, part of that is because I live in Arizona. It's a desert. Um, it's very dry, and that's uh, definitely beneficial for firearms preservation. What I do is basic, just general cleaning. You know, if I'm a, especially if I'm if I've shot corrosive ammunition, absolutely clean the bore, clean the bolt, um, anything that might be subject to residual salts that are going to attract water, um, and then make sure that there isn't crap on the gun, mud, chunks of dirt. You know, I don't go eat a plate of nachos and then get my hands all over guns and leave nacho cheese on them. But that's pretty much all that I do because here that's really all I have to do. There isn't a whole lot of preservative type action required to keep a gun collection in good shape in the desert. Now, if you live somewhere where it's a lot more humid, yeah, there's gonna be more to it. You're gonna wanna make sure you have a nice light coat of oil on the metallic surfaces of the guns. You're gonna to wanna to check them from time to time to make sure that you don't have any uh, rust developing. I know a lot of people will put oxygen absorbers in gun safes, especially if they're safes that you don't open very often, and that will, would certainly help. Uh, I'm sorry, not oxygen absorbers, uh, moisture absorbers. Uh, there are real products for that, and there's also just dried rice. So, uh, a lot of people will look at a video where I'm handling something really obscure and valuable and, and wonder why I'm not using the ubiquitous white gloves. Well, the answer is those white gloves are a, a carryover from the museum system. And in a museum, the policies, formal uh, museum policies, are set up to apply to all types of artifacts that they might have. Wood, paper, um, fur things that are way more fragile than the metal and wood that make up a firearm. So those gloves really aren't that important with firearms. Um, in a museum, you'll have to use them because if you don't use them, the museum risks its accreditation. Uh, but beyond that, no, not really a whole lot necessary. That's one of the nice things. From JL, why did the Soviet Union abandon the RPD in favor of the RPK? The RPK. Uh, how does this contrast to the U.S. Army and Marine Corps decision to adopt the M249 and the subsequent decision by the Marines to switch back to an automatic rifle, the M27 IAR? Well, I can comment on the RPD and the RPK, but to be honest, I haven't really kept up with the what's going on with the individual automatic rifle, the M27, so I'm not really in a good position to comment on that. There were a couple issues with the RPD. Um, it was a more expensive gun than the RPK, it was also kind of a less reliable gun. Uh, the RPD has some extraction issues. Now, as long as you're shooting good ammunition, you're probably not gonna see them, but they do show up if your ammo is less than perfect. And in a military sense, that's something that does happen. So uh, looking at it, you had uh, 
a heavier, less reliable, more expensive gun firing the same cartridge as what you could make just a bigger AK, uh, which would then give you, in the form of the RPK, a lighter gun, a cheaper gun, a gun that now has parts interchangeability, substantial parts interchangeability with the standard infantry rifle. Um, it's still got a larger magazine capacity. You know, it's interesting to point out um, the RPKs used 40 round stick mags and 75 round drums, depending on who was using them, and of course could use the standard 30 round AK rifle magazine, while the RPD had a 100 round belt. Um, the difference between 75 in that drum and 100 in an RPD belt is not that big, and the time difference required to actually reload the thing is substantial. This is really fast to reload. You just pop one out, pop the other on. Belt feds are uh, significantly more time-consuming guns to reload. Not that that's always an issue for the military, but I think in this case it could have been one. It's certainly another, even if it's a small factor, it's a small factor that is in the, in the benefit of the RPK. So, now it's interesting, when I extrapolate this onto the M249 versus the M27 IAR, without knowing the any, any really deep details of that process, I kind of see a lot of the same things going on. The infantry assault, an infantry automatic rifle gives you parts compatibility, it gives you, uh, you know, a gun that's about half the weight of the 249. Now, you don't really have the increased magazine size that you did with the RPK, but that's something that can be changed. There are a lot of large capacity magazine options for the M16, should the military decide to look into them. Um, and certainly a cheaper weapon than the 249. Now, the RPK didn't really give up anything in suppressive fire to the RPD. Uh, the RPD did not have, for example, a changeable barrel. It, didn't, it had a barrel that was a little heavier than this, but not much. So where I think there's a justifiable argument that the 249 has a much greater, uh, gives you much greater firepower at at your fingertips than the IAR, that wasn't really the case with the, the RPK and the RPD. So um, it will be interesting to see what what comes of the M27 IAR. Be interesting to watch it over the next couple of years and in actual use and see what people think. Um, in general, how, how it actually turns out to perform in the field is more significant and more important than all of the theory that goes into the decision beforehand. All right, next up from Stephen M. It has often been brought up that the U.S. has been much slower than most European nations when it comes to adoption of new arms technology and modernization of existing technology, for example, the BAR. Why is that the case? Do you see that as a trend that still exists today, or has the U.S. grown past this? I think there is some truth to it, but there's also some falsehood to it. Um, yes, in some ways, the U.S. has lagged behind. Uh, it took the U.S. a long time to adopt a repeating rifle to replace the, the Trapdoor Springfield. Um, the U.S. took a long time to get a light machine gun uh, or a squad automatic weapon. They held on to that BAR for a long time. On the other hand, the U.S. has kind of been in the forefront in a number of areas. The M1 Garand is a classic example. The U.S. was really the first country to adopt fully on a large scale a self-loading infantry rifle. Um, the Soviets were close behind and the Germans a little farther behind, but the U.S. was on top of that one. Everyone was experimenting with it, but the U.S. actually got it done. Um, what else? Uh, the 1911, not the first. You know, the first military adoption of a self-loading pistol was 1900 with Sw the Swiss and the Luger, but that's 11 years. That's not that big of a deal. Um, you know, the Germans didn't adopt the Luger until 1908. The U.S. adopts the 1911 in 1911. It's not that far behind there. Um, and as for have we, do we still follow that trend to the extent that it is a trend? You know, it's interesting to look at how the U.S., there isn't a whole lot of new innovation coming out of U.S. military small arms, but there is with Russian small arms. The Russians are doing a lot of interesting and cool experiments with things like balanced recoil uh, and some other things where the U.S. pretty much is just continue, continuing to incrementally perfect the M16. And it seems to me that that's probably the result of the M16 being really darn good to begin with, and there isn't a whole lot of room for improvement on it, where the AK, while it's a very good gun, I like the AK, 
it does it doesn't have quite the level of efficiency and ergonomic uh, perfection to it that the M16 does, and I think that gives uh, its users, the Russian Federation, more incentive to go out and kind of design something new that can add other stuff, other interesting features. It's it's more tempting for them to replace the AK than it is for the US to replace the M16. As a result, you know, we don't see a whole lot being done with the M16. Uh, what will be interesting to see is how quickly the US uh, adopts the next fundamentally new piece of small arms technology that comes out, whether that is caseless ammunition, which I kind of doubt, uh, we've gone into that before, or handheld laser rifles, or whatever it ends up being. Uh, next up, from Swan, I'm stationed in France, and I'm wondering, how do you feel about, uh, not specifically gun-free countries, but gun culture-free countries? Well, France, England, and the like most men, uh, developed many great weapons, and some of them still do, the civilian population almost entirely forgot that firearms used to be a part of the culture, and most of all, civil, uh, civil rights. Our mindset strongly differs from the U.S. When fire, where firearms are concerned, and I would like to hear more. Well, um, I, you kind of get a different feel to the firearms culture in a lot of other countries as a result of it being restricted. Uh, I should start by pointing out that while there are a lot of countries where firearms are well, almost all countries' firearms are more heavily regulated and restricted than here in the United States. There are very few countries where they're, like, completely banned. Even in the UK, there are guns that people can have, and everywhere worldwide, pretty much, you can get a lot of... Most of the guns out there can be had as long as you're willing to go through the licensing and regulation process that the government has set up. Now, not that I think that those processes are necessarily a good thing, but there's a difference between restricted guns and simply unavailable ones. So um, France, Germany, the UK, these are places where you, there are people who have more firearm, firearms to a point that would be surprising to a lot of Americans. And what I see in some of those countries is the firearms culture is more professional in a way, more serious, takes itself more seriously. You don't get a lot of the, the really redneck... Um, goofball elements that you do here in the U.S. When when guns are harder to get, when they're more restricted, when ammunition is more expensive, when it's more difficult to access a place where you can actually shoot, people tend to take the firearms more seriously. And while I'm not in favor of heavy restriction, maybe it's a good thing to take the guns a little more seriously. Um, I have not heard about a lot of people in England and France uh, blowing up gigantic blocks of tannerite and injuring themselves. And I think we could all learn from that. So uh, while the firearms culture is far smaller in those places than it is in the U.S., uh, the culture that does exist there is a pretty cool one. And I always enjoy hanging out when I have the opportunity with European firearms enthusiasts. From Brandon, Brandon T., um, could you please explain your schedule and the process you go through when filming videos for Rock Island and James T. Julia? Uh, how long before the auction do you start filming? When do you stop? What's the workday like? How do you choose what to film? All sorts of detailed questions. So, sure, Brandon, we can talk about that for a moment. Um, I typically... So I can normally do four to, at the top end, maybe six videos in a day. And I'm typically doing... 20 to 25 in a trip. So that ends up coming out to about one video a day for close to a month before an auction happens. So in order to do that, I take one week at an auction house, whether it's Rock Island or James D. Julia. I'll typically fly out on a Sunday, start working first thing Monday, and then fly home either Friday night or the next Saturday morning. And it really is a, there's not a lot of uh, just sitting around. It's, it's actually a lot of work to do, although it's work that I love doing. Um, so four to six guns per day. I pick those out in advance. Um, I can I generally get a copy of the catalog. Well, by the time I go out there, the catalog for the auction generally isn't complete. So what I'll get is like an Excel spreadsheet of what's currently in the auction. And I go through that spreadsheet of many thousand items and pick out the things that I'm pretty sure are going to be interesting, which doesn't always work perfectly. There are some things where uh, just based on the, the limited information I have ahead of time, which doesn't include pictures, uh, 
I may pick something out only to discover when I get there that it's been heavily sporterized, for example. Uh, I, the first time I tried to do a video on the 1878 uh, Borchardt single-shot rifle, the falling block, I would picked out one, seemed good, got there, and yeah, lo and behold, it was a totally sporterized gun, and so when something like that happens, you, know, you go back and make sure that you have more guns planned out than you would actually need to do. So there are also a lot of situations where I will miss something in the spreadsheet because either I just overlook it, or it's something I wasn't familiar with, or the description, for whatever reason, doesn't convey the full interestingness of the gun. So there's usually a mix of some of the guns that I plan to do, I don't, and then there are some guns that I didn't realize were there that I will end up covering. So on the guns that I can pre-plan, I do some research, take some notes, make sure I've got things like uh, dates, specific names, chronologies, well in hand. Um, some of the stuff I know beforehand, some of it is entirely researched ahead of time with that video in mind. I kind of always make sure to, to do some follow-up and take some notes before I do a video just to make sure that what I'm pretty sure I know is actually correct. You can't go back and revise video, which is uh, something to keep in mind. If it was a text article, go back and change a typo. On a video, it's much harder to do that. So. Uh, at any rate, I get there and work pretty much a 9 to 5 sort of day because that's when the auction houses are open and that's when their employees are there working. So I don't hang around, you know, at night by myself with the lights off as much as I might want to. Um, oh, let's see, what else do we have in here? Oh, um, how do I choose which guns? It's entirely what I think are going to be interesting. And sometimes that's the history of a particular specific example. Sometimes it is a model that's very interesting. Uh, sometimes it's an experimental thing. Um, I have had people ask if the auction houses uh, request specific guns or have input on that, and I'm happy to say they do not. Um, I'm happy to listen when they come up with suggestions, and I've certainly had times when, you know, someone working there will go, will pull me aside and go, hey, you know, we just saw this come in, and it's this really cool thing, and boy, I, I bet you'd like that. But, you know, is it a matter of, like, the, the owner of the company dictating which guns I'm going to do? No, that's left entirely to uh, my own choice, which is great. I like it that way. Uh, da, 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 da. After I'm done, I do all the filming there. Then I come home um, and I do all of the editing here, which is, can be a time-consuming affair. That's usually another week or so to do. And with all of that in mind, I'm typically at the auction house about six weeks before an auction. Maybe a little more, uh, maybe a little less, just depending on scheduling. But... I need to have them, I'd like to have them all done before the first one posts, which is about a month ahead of time, and then a week for editing, a week actually there. So that's the, the scheduling that I typically do. Unfortunately, I know there are some folks who live in the areas around those auction houses. Unfortunately, the schedule I run doesn't really give me a lot of extra time to hang out with people. I'm often doing follow-up research in the evenings and in the mornings before and after I'm working on, say, the guns that I didn't anticipate doing or guns that I did anticipate, but turned out to be you know, a different model than I was expecting, or something like that. All right, Tyler M. asks, Will drones and robots make the rifle about as relevant to the battlefield of the future as handguns are today? When debating the Second Amendment, the focus has been on firearms. And I wonder if that has given us a blind spot when it comes to defending new weapon technologies that might be more important in the future. Yes and no. I don't think drones are going to have all that much of a specific impact on the infantry. They will make some things easier, they will make some things harder. I don't think we'll see a fundamental change. If you're uh, planning on a career as an Air Force pilot right now, might want to give that a second thought. Um, I think it will have a dramatic and fundamental effect on the Air Force. But that being said, I think you are absolutely correct that the focus on firearms has left a rather large blind spot for a lot of activists, uh, specifically in the realm of information technology. I think mass data mass surveillance, data sharing, and hacking uh, will have a really huge impact on civil liberties and freedom going into the future. Certainly they already have. Um, what we've seen from people like Edward Snowden is that this is a massive ongoing, uh, frankly, surveillance by pretty much all the world's major governments. And the people who think that having an individual, having a rifle will protect them from the government I think are out of date. I don't think that's practical anymore. There, there are certainly reasons to have a rifle, but if you are worried about protecting yourself from the government, I think you need to get online 
and start learning about your digital rights, your privacy rights, and everything that's going on in the world of mass surveillance, because that is far more directly applicable uh, to everybody today than just having a gun. I think the two are mutually supporting. I think they're both important. And uh, focusing on just firearms is, as you say, leaving quite a large blind spot. Uh, next up, from Jake M. Do I like living in the desert slash Arizona? Yes, I very much enjoy living in the Arizona desert. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the video, it makes for a great environment for a gun collection, uh, simply meteorologically. I like the fact that we have a great gun culture here. Not so much that people are seriously enthusiastic about guns, but what's more important is they just don't care. It's not a big deal. Guns are guns. People have them. Um, we don't have to go out of our way to be excited when we see them, and that's a nice thing. And plenty of uh, places that we can go out and shoot in the desert because it's a nice, low-density, sort of populated state. And I like the fact that it's warm. I'm wearing a sweater because it's like 50 degrees outside today and practically Arctic. Jeffrey, no last name, says, he has two questions here. First question is, are there any stocked pistols that are relatively available apart from the Luger, uh, the artillery Luger, the English High Power, like that one, and the C96 broom handle? No. Well, sort of. Um, those are the three by far most common uh, cartridge firing pistols that are readily available with shoulder stocks. Um, all three of those, assuming you have the proper original stock are in fact exempted from the NFA and you can do things like have that stock on that pistol without having to register it um, as a short barreled rifle which is a nice thing. Those are not coincidentally the three types of pistol that were most commonly uh, or made in the largest numbers with shoulder stocks. Now a lot of as you've I'm sure seen on the channel a lot of other pistols from this period 1910s 20s and into the 30s a lot of those guns were available with shoulder stocks if you wanted them, but not nearly so many people tended to want them. Um, these that were produced in large numbers were done so under military contract. So you'll find FN 1903s were available with stocks, uh, Colt 1905s were available with stocks, uh, a lot of the Monlicker pistols, a lot of the Bergman pistols were not uh, always made with stock adapters, but they could be. If you wanted to order one that way from the factory, you could certainly do so. Yeah, but in the civilian market, there were a lot fewer of them made, and thus a lot fewer exist today, and they're more expensive. Now, the one thing that is an option that uh, Jeffrey didn't include in his list here are muzzle-loading pistols. There are were shoulder stocks made for the Colt 1851 and 1860 uh, percussion pistols, and while the originals are quite scarce and valuable today, there are companies making reproductions of them, and under U.S. firearms law, uh, because those do not use fixed ammunition, they're muzzle loaders, you can throw a stock on one of those without any legal implications, just like one of these that's exempted. So if you want to play with a stock pistol and you're interested in muzzle loaders, that's something to take a look at. Uh, Jeffrey's second question in World War I, officers were allowed to buy their own sidearms. In some cases, in fact, they were required to buy their own sidearms. That sounds like an inefficient logistical nightmare. Why was this the policy, and when was the practice stopped? Well, it would be a logistical nightmare if there were much, if there was much logistics involved. And originally, this practice dates back to when a, uh, a company was a much more independent unit than we might expect today and when the officer leading the company was someone of aristocratic birth, for whom it wasn't so much, he wasn't necessarily a military man, this was a social or societal position. You know, you were of a wealthy family, you had some land and you had a title, and well, of course, you would be an officer in the military. And you didn't get to be an officer most of the time by being really good at fighting or being a very competent military uh, soldier. You were an officer because your family had the right last name. And those folks were, they supplied all of their own accoutrements. They supplied their own horse because, frankly, because they wouldn't have been happy with the crappy horse that the military would have been willing to give them. They wanted a nice horse and a nice sword and a good sidearm. And that practice carried over into the industrial age and what we see in those cases are the practice kind of narrowing down a bit. So the British are the classic example here. Um, in many cases into World War I, commissioned officers would provide their own sidearms, 
the requirement was that they had to use the service cartridge. So, yeah, you could buy any revolver you wanted in 455 Webley, and that took care of most of the logistical issues because you could get the ammunition because it was standardized ammunition. That said, and well, in earlier periods, the officer is not really going to do much shooting with his pistol anyway. It's there as a badge of rank. You'll occasionally maybe need to threaten someone with it, and in some, you know, hideous worst-case scenario, you might not need to actually empty the whole thing in combat. But you weren't running around with, you know, 100 rounds of pistol ammunition on your body in quickly accessible pouches. Pistol was loaded once, and you pretty much left it in the holster. So there wasn't much logistical issue involved in providing ammunition. You provided your pistol, you provided your ammunition too. So you know, buy 100 or a couple hundred cartridges when you have the opportunity before you deploy, and that will... Uh, really be everything that you need through, uh, you know, your service until you should find yourself at another place where you can buy some ammunition. Da, 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 da. Uh, when did this practice end? Pretty much World War One. Um, by World War Two, this this was not uh, not going on anymore. Although in World War Two, you would still see high level officers, general officers, carrying their own personal guns if they wanted to. Uh, you'd also see individual soldiers from time to time carrying personal guns. You could, you know, if you were a U.S. soldier in World War II, you can write home and ask Pa to send you that Smith & Wesson revolver because you'd like to have, you know, an extra sidearm in your foxhole in case the Germans or the Japanese happen to show up in the middle of the night, and that wasn't terribly uncommon to do. And in that case, you kind of scrounge the ammo for it. But in general, out of practice by World War II with officer-supplied pistols. Should mention Patton, for example, carried his own revolver because he liked it. And you know, when you're a general level officer, you can kind of do stuff that uh, lower ranking folks can't get away with. Uh, Vincent asks, are there any pistols that use the moniker style clip? I know a lot of early pistols using stripper clips, but I know of none that use a clip that has to stay in the pistol itself. And you're pretty much right. There were very few. The idea of a moniker clip, it's like what you have in an M1 Garand, or in a Carcano, or in a Commission Gewehr 88, where the clip and the ammunition all goes into the gun and stays there until you chamber the last round or fire the last round, at which point the clip ejects out or, pop or falls out the bottom. There weren't really any pistols done like that. Um, the, the vast majority, pretty much all of the common self-loading pistols that, that didn't have uh, detachable magazines used stripper clips, where you use the clip just to feed the ammo in and then you discard the clip. The exception to that would be some of the early manually repeating pistols, where they had, in particular, a monkey tail style clip. You'll see, for example, on, uh, well, actually even on Bergman repeating pistols, where the clip goes in and it does act as the feed lips for the magazine, and when you're done, you take the empty clip out. So. So yes, the Bergman 1896s did that, and then of course some of the early manually repeating pistols from the 1880s and 1890s did as well. But nothing that was ever really super common or well adopted, and not anything I can think of after 1900. Next up, from John D., I have found a few rumors in books of an experimental version of the Bren gun, possibly designed by BSA, in 50 caliber, possibly 50 Vickers. Have you ever heard of this? Um, well... I actually misread your question when I went through it and just realized now that you said Bren gun, uh, what I was going to talk about was the Lewis gun in 50 caliber. Um, I have not, I'm not familiar with a 50 caliber Bren gun, but uh, I have now done like 20 seconds of thinking about that one, so there might be one out there. Um, what I do know about is that there was an experimental version of the Lewis gun in 50 caliber, 50 Vickers. Uh, which was a little less potent than 50, the 50 Browning machine gun cartridge. And uh, the Lewis gun version was developed in 1921. Uh, it was originally intended as kind of a general purpose heavy gun, anti-tank, anti-vehicle, anti-light uh, position, pillbox, anti-aircraft, and it was rejected on the grounds that it fired too slowly. I uh, don't know what the actual rate of fire was, but it did fire from a drum, uh, apparently held 37 rounds in a pan style drum like the original Lewis. It did come back up in 1924, uh, where they were hoping to use it as an aircraft armament. The British government took a look at it there and again rejected it, but at that point they rejected uh, 
actually what they rejected was the the idea of putting 50 caliber guns on aircraft which maybe would turn out to have been the wrong decision come world war ii but um yeah it had a couple of it had some reliability issues and uh, a lack of any real need for a 50 caliber um, gun of that type so uh the bren i don't know i'll have to look that one up um later uh from ben w can you speak on the gun market and gun manufacturing in Germany and Japan after World War II? Why do we see guns from Germany but not Japan today? What was the philosophy of the small arms market in these countries after the war? I think it's not quite so much about specifically after the war, but rather that um, the gun manufacturers in Germany were by and large commercial producers that had gotten to, into working for the German government and military, where the gun production in Japan was primarily military owned arsenals that didn't really do any commercial production even when they could before the war. The gun culture in Japan simply has never been as robust um, at a civilian level as it has been in Europe and North America. So yes there were gun companies, there was hunting in Japan prior to World War II, but not all that much of it and most of what there was was uh, most of the guns that were there were supplied through Europe and the Americas. After World War II, a lot of that uh, was kind of codified in uh, Japanese law, and you see a little bit of manufacture there. AR-180s were made uh, in Japan for a short time. Winchester did some manufacturing in Japan, I believe, but never a whole lot just because there hadn't been in the first place. Germany, on the other hand, had these large commercial production companies like Mauser and Walther, and when the war ended, well, you know, they weren't part of the government, they weren't part of the military, they were quite eager to get back into production. And if that meant uh, making commercial guns for the civilian market instead of military, that's just fine with them. Um, some of those factories were actually also basically taken over and uh, immediately uh, put back into production by the Allies. So you'll, for example, you'll find uh, French production Mauser K98s that were produced by Mauser, um, basically starting the day that the French occupied Oberndorf. And um, yeah, commercial interests that led to those companies remaining in production in, in existence. All right, Christopher, maybe Christopher, spelled weird. Uh, anyway, says, as a non-shooter, I have to ask, what are the practical purposes for top-mounted magazines on machine guns like the Bren and the Type 96? That's actually a pretty easy one. The advantage of a top-mounted magazine is that it doesn't prevent you from getting into a nice low prone position with the gun. So if you have a bottom-mounted magazine, it is easier to reload. It's kind of more traditional and conventional. However, it prevents you from getting low on the gun uh, because the magazine is sticking out. This is, for example, why the US never had a 30-round BAR magazine, is they decided it would have made the gun too high up off the ground. Uh, if you have a side-mounted magazine, you can get nice and low to the ground, and it doesn't obscure your sights, but it tends to balance the rifle off to one side. I don't know that that's a particularly big deal. Um, I don't know that it matters all that much. Um, it's been done by some reasonably successful guns. The Johnson light machine gun was that way. The problems that, that led to prevented the Johnson from being adopted on a really huge scale didn't have anything to do with the magazine being on the side. Uh, the German FG-42 did it and in the process was able to really make sort of a pseudo bullpup design. Um, the Sten, the Sterling, a bunch of submachine guns do it. I think it's an arguable thing. I think the problems with it are more uh, in people's minds than they are real problems. Uh, and then of course having the magazine on top means you can get the gun nice and low to the ground, but it's going to obscure your sights. And of course it's still centrally balanced. So when you have the top mounted magazines, you'll have the sights offset to the side. This can potentially cause issues for left versus right-handed shooters, although in a military context that's generally not considered a problem because they don't care about left-handed shooters, those people should just learn to shoot right-handed. Um, in my own practical experience, which is not, not too substantial, but I have shot a number of top-fed machine guns as a left-hander, and what I honestly find is it's not that big a deal to just roll my cheek a little farther over the stock and use the sights that are off on the left side of the gun isn't really that big a deal. Now the downside to a top-mounted magazine, um, other than potentially looking goofy, is uh, 
it sticks up. And this is something you'll find in some memoirs from American troops in the Pacific Theater uh, who are fighting Japanese armed with Nambus, is they could spot the machine gun by the magazine wobbling back and forth over the top of foliage or cover when the gun was firing. So uh, in some cases, actually, the like the Type 11 Japanese light machine gun, which had a little low-profile hopper fed by stripper clips, that gun was preferred by some Japanese troops because it didn't have this giveaway of a magazine sticking up high off the gun, but it also didn't have a magazine sticking out the bottom that would prop the gun high up off the ground. So everything is a trade-off. There is no perfect answer, and having the top-mounted magazine allows you to get low to the ground and to some extent helps uh, gravity helps the magazine feed. So nice, not, not super important maybe, but a nice little bonus. We have one last question from Luis. Uh, this will be an easy one. He asks, what is your opinion on the Cristobal Carbine Model 3? The answer is, I think they're really interesting, but I have never actually been able to handle one, much less shoot one, so I can't really say a whole lot about them. Um, chambered in 30 Carbine, a, uh, a lever delayed action, which is interesting and neat. Um, I have messed around with a cut up parts kit for one, but that's the extent of my experience, so I would love to get my hands on one someday. I don't there are probably maybe a couple in the United States, but none that I'm aware of. So that might be something that I have to go overseas to find. And if that's the case, well, I would love to do so. Uh, thank you to all the folks on Patreon who do contribute and help support the channel. Uh, in fact, we are getting very close to the Patreon goal that will allow me to start traveling overseas, which would be really cool. I would love to get have the ability financially to be able to travel uh, once or a couple times a year outside of the U.S. and find things like Cristobal Model 3 carbines that just aren't available here. So at any rate, if you'd like your question to be in the pot for the next time we do a Q&A next month, uh, check out patreon.com slash forgotten weapons. And uh, to everyone else, thank you very much for your support. Hope you enjoy the video and tune in again tomorrow for more Forgotten Weapons.